Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. This is the show you've been waiting for. Well, I don't know if you've been waiting for it, but this is the show I've been waiting for. Why? Because we're talking about some of the most sophisticated investment vehicles today. We're gonna to talk about the black boxes that are known as family offices, and we'll even talk a little bit about private equity. We'll talk about Maybe we'll talk a little bit about how the stock market works and things you need to watch out for. And I've got the perfect person for that conversation. We're talking to Ron Geffner today, and he's an ex-SEC enforcement officer, enforcement lawyer. He worked with the SEC, and here in the US, if you're watching from overseas, the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission. These are the badasses that keep all the masters of the universe in line. Ron was that guy. Now he helps the masters of the universe avoid all kinds of pitfalls or tries to get them out of trouble when they ignore his advice in the first place. Yeah, that never happens. Join me in welcoming Ron Geffner to the Inside BS Show. Ron, welcome aboard. So it never they, they always listen to you, right? Nobody ever ignores your advice. <laughs> do, you, do you have kids? I do have kids and I am married. <laughs> it's the same thing. It's the same thing. So you get to give them the advice, they ignore it, and then when they ignore the advice, you don't get to say, well, I told you so. <laughs> the, only, the only difference is sometimes the clients have to pay for it. <laughs> All right, so give us- As opposed to I give pay us my your, Give us your wife. background. It's so fascinating. Tell us, first of all, how did you find your way into the SEC in the first place, and then what made you decide to do what you're doing now? So going to the SEC, when I- applied for the job. There were six positions open unbeknownst to me and about 2000 applicants. Wow. So we'll call it a lottery ticket. I'm sure everybody was qualified for the position. It was a great way to begin my career because it wasn't just about going after the bad guys. It was actually going after the truth. And so it's not that you're looking to bring in action per se. You just want to figure out what really happened. So then you can determine whether it's actionable. And it is designed to keep people honest. It's like having somebody watch a cookie jar. And the whole, um, the, one of the main reasons that our securities markets are the strongest in the world is it's designed to be a balanced system. We try and reduce legally as best as we can. When I say we, the regulator, regulators, the lawmakers, um, the edges that people have had. And it's taken time to figure them out and whittle them down to make it a more fair system. So you guys weren't sitting in a room going, ah, 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 let's see who we could go after today. <laughs> I, I was, I was, but everybody else around me was not. Now, I would actually get in really early, all kidding aside, and I'd open up the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and I'd look at headline stories, and then I would check the system, and if there was not a case brought, it would be something I'd start looking into as well. So, and this is, this is fascinating because I think of... You know, the, the people who operate on the dark side, the people who work, uh, you know, who run afoul of the law are always some of the most creative, most ingenious people in the world. And if they would just put their minds to good, would probably make a fortune. So how does the SEC or any agency keep up with, you know, people are coming up with like credit default swaps and, you know, all kinds of crazy derivative ideas. And would you guys, like at the SEC, would you sit back and go, Man, how did they think of that? Like, would you be, would you be, like every day there's some new way to make money that's, you know, in the gray or pushing the envelope. Would you guys be surprised by that? So, so within the SEC, the SEC had focuses. My focus was what's called 40 Act, which means the Investment Advisors Act of 1940 and the Investment Company Act of 1940. And this is pre Madoff. Pre Madoff, most people, really hadn't put as much thought into this industry as they should have. Post Madoff, it's um, continued to expand. And uh, obviously, the private fund industry has also grown dramatically over the last 30 years, 40 years. Uh, what I do day in, day out right now is I focus on launching hedge funds, private equity funds, venture capital funds, real estate funds. We launch about 80 funds a year. Our practice based on prequin which is probably one of the better known databases, ranks the law firm that I founded number three in the United States and number seven in the world. So when you talk about amazement, the amazement's more on this end. And it's not about regulatory defense per se. 
I'm more of a deal guy at this stage of my life. So it's people coming to us with different ideas on how, how they've been making money, how they've been trading. So cryptocurrency, we were looking at that eight years ago. Bill Miller, who's a famous asset manager, uh, did exceptionally well on Bitcoin. We've been dealing with cannabis. Um, so you hear about DeFi, any new developments, we we get to see them early days because it's the people on the front lines that are seeing these trends that sit there and say, okay, I think I found a way to monetize it. And you mentioned black box, whether it's quantitative trading uh, and a black box indicates no human override, gray box indicates human override or influence. So that part is really amazing. And the other interesting part is it's not limited to people just coming out of the asset management industry. So I was just at a ranger game with a buddy of mine and he was telling me a story. He met a kid who was 18 years ago that, and he dropped out of college eventually to run money. He's now managing $100 million at the age of 25 in the crypto space. So the point is, you're, um, I've had the fortune of working with Dick Fold from Lehman Brothers, a friendly with Dennis Levine, who's ex um, Boski, Michael Milken guy. We turned uh, Martin Scarelli, we turned him into the SEC in a whistleblower case. I'm, I'm friendly with Harry Markopoulos, who's the Madoff tipper. So you meet so many fascinating people and hear their stories. Their stories um, brings the humanity of what we do to the rest of the people. And that part's actually really lost because people presume finance and Wall Street, a bunch of, even though I'm wearing a white shirt today because I'm on air, as opposed to wearing a patterned shirt and freaking the cameras out. The point is, it's more to it than that. You have doctors, you have lawyers, uh, that go into the space. People want to make a difference, not just about making money. So it, it reflects what we see in society, whether you're an accountant, whether you're an administrator, whether you're a lawyer, 80% of the people are pretty decent. 15% of the people are pretty amazing. And 5% of the people we never want to have any sure. contact with that pretty much plays out in every. Industry. So this is, I, I'm glad, I'm glad you brought it up uh, that way. What, what we see on shows like billions, for example, right? Because people who are, people who are watching the show and listening, I bet you a good portion of them are into billions, which is a, a show on Showtime. That's, that's a very small minority of people that are, that are, that operate at that level. And even smaller minority are the people who operate at that level who are operating in the gray or pushing the envelope. Is that correct? That is, but any time I've never really met somebody, and I don't know if you have, that upon meeting them, they're like, yeah, no, I want to break the law. I want to violate it. So, so usually, usually what I found is mo it's a variable. The law is a business variable. So I'll harken back. I'm shocked I even use the word harken. I'll go back 25 years ago when I first started Status and Goldberg. I was 30 years old. I'm 55 now. And one of my clients at that stage was formerly a lawyer and he set up tax shelters. And I'm doing other work at the time for him. And as we're talking about it, he tells me he got fined by the IRS a million dollars. So in my ignorance at 30, which is very common, I'm like, well, I guess you'd never do that again. He goes, no, I do it every day. Because we made five million and we got fined one million. So law is just a variable. So as a lawyer, obviously there are certain variables where we don't want to be associated with, because we're also running a business. All of us who are listening to this, we're running a business and our job is to also help sustain that business. So there's certain risks we don't want to pursue. Like it's going on right now with cryptocurrency. People are issuing coins. Those coins in the US are, are a security based on the current laws that we have today. And they, they disregard those laws. And the reality is um, some of those people will be called out. Most probably won't. There's only so much money as a society that we put into the police force, the SEC, the FBI. They're, they have limited limited budgets as well. So let's talk about. I don't want to. I don't want to get into you know assessing the assessing the morality of you know like with car crashes and and auto recalls. You know I don't want to get into the the assessing the morality of that. Let's talk a little bit about some of the edgy stuff like with cannabis right now. It's tough, isn't it? Isn't it tough 
to bank cannabis money in federally insured banks, right? So how do you, with, with funds related to cannabis, what are you guys doing, you know, that, without obviously revealing any confidences, what are you guys doing on the cutting sure. edge with cannabis funds and that sort of thing? Ca cannabis funds, um, there's a range of different issues that come up. I'll, I'll keep it on the simple level here. If you have a U.S. invest, if you have a fund that's set up and it's domiciled in the United States and it's only attracting U.S. assets, it's they're operating based on this belief, which I believe is justified because I also do venture capital investing in the space uh, under the Cole memo that the U.S. Attorney's Office will not enforce federal law that's violative of as long as it's compliant. Oh, interesting. Law. Okay. So, so it's really relegated currently to the states. So that in and of itself isn't problematic. And we advise the asset managers that invest in the space. That being said, there are lawyers that are advising these operating businesses. And the downside of cannabis not being federally legal, they cannot deduct their expenses mm. for tax purposes. So they're paying taxes on gross revenues, you know, gross of expenses. So sometimes when people are building their, these businesses from a legal perspective, they bifurcate, they split up the part of the business that touches the plant from the business that touches things other than the plant so that they can deduct expenses from the not plant touching parts of the business. What I started getting a lot of calls on, but we're not guiding people, are people applying for applications uh, to become mm -hmm. a dispensary. And that those are nuanced areas and early days, it seemed that there was a lot, there were a few consultants that charged a significant amount of money and also took a piece yeah. of the business. So it's still really the wild west on some of this. And you're also dealing with an, an, any new area. You know, the model is you go through growth and then hyper growth and then like stabilization. Um, yeah. Well, the stabilization really occurs when people start to acquire yeah. other people. So you see acquisitions occurring in the space and then stabilization, I would say. So it happens. How do you how do you help your clients assess the risk? Because I understand that the federal government has that stance now, right? But it's it, it's almost like you. I mean, you worked for the federal government. It could, it's like the weather, right? You could wait a minute and you get a new attorney general, or the policy could change. And like, I mean, we have elections in this country every four years, so your business model may only be good. It may have a shelf life of of only four years, right? How do you help your clients assess that risk? So, I mean, that risk is very, well, look, it's impossible to accurately assess would be my theory. You're really giving people odds based on precedent and you're trying to advise them of the facts applied to the precedent. With regard to my perspective on cannabis, eight or nine years ago when people started investing in the space, and then you fast forward two years later, different service providers get involved. So the people that raise money for funds are called placement agents or third-party marketers. A few of our clients started to call us up and they wanted to raise money, but they were concerned about the risk. And I think in many cases they did not, despite our guidance that, look, I'm writing checks myself and I'm a lawyer. So as, as I said, mm -hmm. I do venture capital investing in the space. I don't want to lose my license. I make my living practicing law. So I could not take a stronger step forward by acknowledging what I'm doing as a, as a lawyer in good standing who... Um, is active in the media, so I could be an easy target sure. by the regulators. All right. Let so I, the way I look at it is, but to answer your question, Dave, there's so many people and so many, the majority of the states now have legalized it. I cannot see in good conscience like any reasonable likelihood that the go federal government would ever reverse their course. And I think it's only a matter of time. It's not an if, it's a when. It becomes federally legal because... They're missing out on tax. Right, dollars. that's the pivot. Yeah, I, I agree. And that seems completely. To be a big issue. I think the pivot is to make it fully legal so they can capitalize on the tax revenue. Sure. And then not going into the morality, the the illegal market in cannabis is still ridiculously yeah. huge. So if you want to control the illegal market, you you do it by legalizing it. It's like controls. gaming. It's it's the same exactly thing like gambling. gaming. Yes, because there's no, there, you're yeah. you're not going to stop it. You might as well capitalize on it. Hundred, I hundred percent agree with and, you. And and put in controls, and when you capitalize on it, you're then able to employ more people to make sure they enforce the rules, thereby shrinking the illegality. Doesn't mean we're going to stamp right. it out. 
So it's it, like I said, we, it's only a matter we of time. as a society in the United States tend to be ahistoric, and this is it's obvious that we didn't learn anything from prohibition, right? So we need to we need yeah. to wise up about this. Um, so Ron, talk to me about uh, the you know there's so, I mean there's so much we can get into here. Talk to the the regular person, the average person, or the person who's like me or who's listening to the show, watching the show. They don't understand um, capital raising. Explain. You mentioned like third party people who raise capital. How do those people? How do those people make a living? Do they take a piece of what they raise? Is there a graduated percentage? Explain to the people listening and watching how a capital raise takes place. Okay, so. I'm going to stick with what is yeah, common, do the basics. but there's exceptions. There, there's exceptions to every rule that I would tell you because it's a negotiated transaction between two people and the person who's having assets raised may be ignorant and agree to something or may be desperate and agree to something that is not commercial. So I'm going to stick to capital raising in two forms. There's capital raising for operating businesses, companies like you and I are starting a restaurant chain versus capital raising for um, private funds. And, and, and by the way, there's capital raising beyond these two subjects, but I'll stick with those. So if somebody's raising money for an operating business or for a private fund, on average, the law is they need to be registered as a broker and have their license held by a broker dealer who supervises them. The license is a series seven license and the payment goes from the person who's having assets raised directly to the broker dealer they take their cut and they pay their, their underlying broker and brought in the deal. Um, in many cases, if you're raising for an operating business, it could be anywhere from 5% to 10% of the raise that the broker gets on average. Are we seeing different terms of it? Sure, where they're taking a piece of the business. In private fund industry, on average, now this, the placing agent is referred to as a third party marketer. They take 20% of the management fee and the incentive mm. allocation. So it means is if you're writing a check for half a million dollars to a fund, it actually is not coming out of your pocket. It comes out of the pocket of the person managing your money. So it reduces their profits if there are any. So they take a piece of the management fee and they take a piece of the incentive. That's the terms. Wow. So Talk about, so private raises then, does, is somebody who's putting that together, they have to be registered as well? So if you're, if you're starting a private business and you say to me, hey, I know you, you know a lot of rich friends, can you invite them over for coffee? I want to pitch them. Do I have to be registered? Technically, technically, do I have to be registered in order to do that? There, there is something called the finder exception. I've yet to ever have it as I understand it. And it's not the area I focus on. I have a partner who focuses on, um, regulatory and compliance, even though I have a background mm. in it. A finder would be somebody who basically is a one-off, one-time life so experience. So it's just one time. And they just happen to make an introduction. There are also some exceptions for lawyers if they want to introduce people uh, tied to separately managed accounts um, because it's not deemed to be a security. Mm. But with regard to uh, if, if you and I form an LLC, a limited liability company, a limited partnership, an S corp, in other words, a corporation, the interest in those businesses, the interest in the LLC, the limited partnership interest, the shares of the, of the corporation, those are all securities. So if you make a commission in connection with the sale of a security in the United States, you're required to be registered with a broker okay. dealer. So it's that simple. If you went back 20 years ago, people used to fight me on it. It's become very commonly understood, I'd say the last seven years. It's the people that generally do not know, um, they have no familiarity with the law or they intentionally want to put their head in the sand. I'd say they want to put their head in the sand because they're desperate or they commoditize these issues. And your fear shouldn't be regulators coming at you. Your fear should be that one of your investors who lost money is upset. He hires a lawyer or he turns you in because of a whistleblower claim, depending on the... Um, the viability of yeah, an action. Yeah. Okay. So when we see these, and I see them more and more these days. When I see, and this is a completely separate thing. I know I'm mixing things up now, but but I see these. I see okay. these REITs, right? And there are there are people out there. Like there's a guy in my line of business. I'm sure many of you are who are watching, listening, are is, are familiar with him. Grant Cardone 
has a has a REIT. He has a real estate fund and he's buying up residential properties, renting it and making a fortune on the management fees and that sort of thing. Technically, he has to be registered to raise money for that REIT, right? No, there's an there's an issuer exemption. Oh. So if you and I if you and I launch a fund, and um, there's there's a nuanced answer. That's why I'm going with okay. the fact pattern. So let's say we you and I um, own the management entity that receives the fees 50-50. If you bring in a hundred million and I bring in ten dollars, theoretically we should not deviate from that 50-50. If we then start to say, look, Dave, you did a great job. Let's come up with a formula. And for every dollar you bring in, you get X. That would violate the issue ah. exemption. Because now you're really being paid specifically on what you raise for our business. Okay, so if it's my business, I don't have to be registered. If I'm if I if I create the fund, you and I create the fund together, you and I can go out and raise all the money we want and we don't have to be registered. Or a restaurant. Right. Or a restaurant. Like I actually just wrote a check to a restaurant that is opening up in Napa, hopefully in the next couple of months. Uh, no broker dealer involved. I went, uh, the chef, two Michelin star chef, was raising several million dollars. That's great, okay. Yeah, good, good for you, See, good for you for doing that, helping, so I'm not, I'm good for you it. for doing that, for helping the uh, helping the hospitality industry coming back. So I, I appreciate that. Seemed like the yes. right time, at first time. And it's not a vanity investment, because I live in New York. So if I'm there once every five years, I consider yeah. myself lucky. <laughs> And I'm sure I'll have to pay the regular bill and have to pay. Yeah, you're going to pay. You're going to pay for that for that uh, phenomenal glass of wine that you get at your restaurant. That's terrific. All right. So, Ron, I'm going to ask you this question now. I want you to take a minute and think about it. Let's talk. um, I want to I want to shift gears and I want to talk about um, I want you to give us the the the, you know, kind of the definition and how how family offices work. Folks on the show hear me talk a little bit about family offices when I do what I'm going to do now and I mention our sponsors. So I want you to give us the, uh, you know, the the brief, uh, the brief education on what a family office is, and I want you to do it in just one minute. Folks, you heard me mention family offices, and you know, if you listen to the show, that we're brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, and they do a lot of accounting work in the family office space. And since Ron's going to educate us on the family office space today... I'm going to talk about Sandrowski's business valuation practice. You see, if you have a dispute, let's say you're a lawyer. I know a lot of lawyers are listening to the show. A lot of lawyers watch the show. You're a family law attorney or you're uh, you're an attorney who handles litigation matters. And there are two partners and there's a dispute as to the value of the business. Partner X says the business is worth a million dollars. Partner Y says it's worth two million dollars. And then you got to figure out how you're going to break apart that business. But first, you got to agree on what the value of the business is. Each side needs someone to value the business. You need an expert. And there's no expert better than Sandrowski Corporate Advisors because they've been doing this sort of thing for over 35 years. Now, you know they're based in the Midwest, but they work all over the United States and they have phenomenal business valuation experts. I work with a gentleman there by the name of John Alfonsi. He's great at business valuations, but you know what he's even better at? If you listen to the show, you know he's great at explaining things in a way that the average person can understand it. In fact, and, I, and I'm going to whisper this because I don't want Ron to get in trouble, even a judge can understand it when John explains it to them. That's why Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is great. They not only do a fantastic job of valuing the business, they can break it down and explain it so that the court can get it. If, God forbid, you're in front of a jury, a jury could get it. And John is a professor, so he's one of the best people to help you with this sort of thing. If you want to explore everything Sandrowski Corporate Advisors can do for you. I encourage you right now, call 866-717-1607. You can pause the show and call them right now, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a law firm with a different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. So you want to build a book of business. I know you do. That's what you come to me for. Well, Here's what I want to do. I want to give you something for free for watching the show, for listening to the show. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com. 
There you can enter your contact info and download my free business development plan. And this is business development based on relationships. It's based on thought leadership. There's no cold calling involved. There's no hokey uh, billboard advertising. This is legitimate big boy, big girl business development. RevenueRoadmapGuide.com. Enter your contact info. Download your guide for free. It's the same one I use with my clients. You can customize it for your professional practice. Our guest today is Ron Geffner, and he's helping us understand the basics of finance and compliance with finance. He's someone who's been doing this for his entire career. If you need help with any of the things that he's discussing today, you can call him in New York at 212-573-6660. He'll work with you anywhere in the United States. He's based in New York because if you're into finance, why wouldn't you be based in New York? 212-573-6660. Zero. Give Ron a call if you need help with any of the stuff we're talking about today. Okay, Ron. Before we, by the way, it's glo- it's global. So global. It's okay, everywhere. anywhere in the world. If you're listening in Australia, India, China, call Ron. To, well, maybe not China, but call Ron today. No, wait. Funny enough, in the last 24 hours, I had a call with somebody in Australia, somebody in China, and every place you actually perfect. In India. Actually, two calls. Time Wonderful. In so you asked. So you asked what a family yes, office please. is. So. There's no universal definition, but the idea is it's a family of significant wealth where it becomes centralized. It's usually a key member of the family decides to provide asset management, wealth management services to other family members. And that can include tax guidance, estate planning, um, generational wealth planning. And it often like, like you can think of the Rockefeller family, right? Rockefeller family office ran across one of the guys managing their assets. I think they had a hundred billion in assets. I don't know if it's all Rockefeller family money, but the point is, um, and I looked up the definition, just curious what the threshold was on Google. So here they were saying generally one with over a hundred million of investable assets, but there's families with 30, 40 million or less that that becomes their focus and what they do for a living. Sure. Sure. And talk to people about uh, individual or single family offices versus multifamily offices and explain if there is any, what the regulation is for them. So there really isn't a regulation that defines what a family office is based on my understanding. A a single family office would be my family and I, I sold the business. I, let's say I sold it for a hundred million dollars. I might have a wealth manager. Maybe I go to, I'll just throw out random names. Morgan Stanley, uh, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, whomever you go to that you trust. But I may w- I may then eventually want to internalize it rather than going to an external source because I, I may not know their conflicts of interest. I may not know their commitment just to my family. So I may bring in, or I may do both. I may internalize it and have some external people as well. But that's a single family office. A multifamily office would be I'm managing for my 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 assets and my family's assets. I, I start my my brother, my sister, their children. We aggregate all of our assets together. So well, yeah, I, I, that's that's a great definition. And and one of the things that I've seen is I've seen people like you who are who help people you know who are doing deals and somebody exits their business or they sell a portion of their business. Now all of a sudden they got this windfall and they say to you, Hey Ron, listen, I got people pitching me on investments left and right. I can't deal with all these with all these pitches. You know, one out of five, one out of ten may be good who can help me vet these investments? And then you would say, oh, listen, one of my buddies just started a family office and they're open to bringing other people in and that's how a multifamily office is formed. So now, now, so multifamily office means it's still in the same Oh, interesting. Once a multifamily office or a family office takes on third party capital, like our buddy who just sold the business for $100 million, they now have to look at the Investment Advisors Mm. Act to determine both state law where they're domiciled and federal law to determine whether they have to register as an investment advisor. Now, if they're trading commodities or futures or certain other instruments, they might also have to register as a commodity trading advisor or commodity pool operator under the Commodity Exchange Hmm. Act. If they engage in other types of transactions, it can trigger broker dealer issues. So understanding then the playing field um, and the registration of itself is fine. People seem to be very freaked out by having to register. It's 
in my mind, if you're running a healthy, clean business, it's not a game changer to have to register. And interestingly enough, if you look at, if you go outside the United States, usually pre-COVID, I was in London, Dublin, Luxembourg, at least once or twice a year. And what I learned is the rest of the world looks at the SEC as all, it it, uh, makes me think of Lord of the Rings and that Mordor, that's how they look at it. So they get freaked out by taking US money under management because many of those firms don't want to register because they assume the SEC is going to look at them all the time and bring an enforcement action. Mm, interesting. So it is very interesting. So while some people perceive the federal government to be that way, I don't. Having policies and procedures and abiding by them, it, it most of the time, the SEC doesn't cause a situation where there isn't one uh, right, that exists. Right. So let me, so let me ask you this then, Ron. So if I'm, so I have a, so my, my family has a family office hypothetically and, um, the Jones family that lives up the street sells their medical billing business and they come into $150 million and they say, look, you guys have been doing this for years. We want to join forces with you. It makes sense then to call somebody like you or your firm and have you advise us on what we need to do before we invest in anything, right? Because I can take in their money, but if I, once I start to invest, based on what I just heard you say, depending on what the investment is, I got to be really careful. Oh, completely accurate. And hopefully they've used you for valuation services before they flip the medical uh, billing business. But um, that aside, yeah, you want it, you should research it out before you do it to make sure that you comply with the laws in advance. It's... Um, you want to do it prophylactically. You don't want to do it after the fact because after the fact could require rights of rescission. Uh, we, I've I've met people along the way that have violated the law, and, and not one of them, or or very few of them, would want to go to the regulator and say, "Mayor Culpa, I did this. My intentions were good. I want to undo this. I, I want your blessing. And if there's a small fine to pay, I'll, I'll right. pay." Very, very, very yeah. few people are willing to do that. So. You do deal with it prophylactically. Now, the issue I find that's interesting, um, which I deal with, but I don't deal with it necessarily where we're getting legal work doing it. I deal with it in the prospective client calling me. So two situations. Had a a guy who who was um, teaching one of uh, Saudi Arabia's royal families, and he was American. He thought he could maybe make an introduction to an asset manager. I explained, well, you need to have a Series 7, and he um, didn't listen to me. He didn't want to spend 10 grand, roughly, in dealing with the situation. About a year later, he calls me up, and he has a contract with a firm who is going to bring him in-house, and and they're going to pay him like a decent salary, but I find out he introduced him to an investment that they got for $500 million. And I think he was getting paid like 250000 a year for the job. He would have made literally maybe $10 million on that one transaction right. had he spent the $10,000 and set himself right. up. But because people come with these opportunities and they doubt the likelihood of these opportunities, they don't want to go out of pocket to vet and then vet their idea. So they run with the idea, they execute on the idea, and then they're like, they're in a worse position. You either have already given the gift to somebody, you've given them the service, and now you're saying, oh, you like it? Please pay me fairly. It it, it was like, imagine going to a restaurant and there's no price on the menu, you eat your meal, and then pretty much you can decide what you pay them. Yeah, so- It's not gonna go well for the restaurant. The thing that really grabs me there, and this is of real benefit to the people who are listening and the people who are watching is, all this guy did, and with the hypoth- it's a hypothetical guy, it could have been a woman, all they did yeah. was make an introduction, right? And so many of us do that, Ron, every day. I mean, I'm introducing people to one another every day. I'm not asking for a fee for it, but if I wanted to make that my business, what you just said is a, a real nugget. I, if I wanted to make that my business, if I wanted to, if I knew a lot of wealthy people and I wanted to make introductions to them and take a fee for doing it based on what money was raised, I got to go get a Series 7 and I got to place my license somewhere. 
Yeah, that's really that's a that's a great takeaway because I, you know, I think I know people who are making those introductions now who haven't done that. <laughs> well, look, I've easily introduced probably 10, 20, 30 million. I did get a call once from a group that was looking to place $500 million. So I reached out to one or two clients. I said, look, if um, I may go get a Series 7 for this one-off transaction, this is a life-changing right. Right. opportunity. Right. But it's interesting, a lot, most people look, most people welcome these gifts and you hope it develops goodwill. And they're gonna give you legal is, work, they'll give me consulting work as a result and we'll, and, you know, and, and we'll be thrilled with that. We're not looking for a fee for the money, but 500 million is, you know, you're talking about a lot of money. But I've learned also, not that this changes the course of action, even that goodwill, half the people don't appreciate the goodwill yeah. gesture. Some do, some don't. It, it doesn't change my behavior. I'm going to go out in the world. I'm going to smile and say hi to people. Like I, as I walked into the gym early yesterday morning, there was a homeless guy. And I remember reading an article online. As you know, We all wake up in the morning. We look at our phones. It was on court. And it was about, it was a, su- a picture of a subway of some guy laying on the floor and some older woman next to him. And the person who wrote the article was saying that this guy was acting crazy. And this older woman just touched his hand and ended up giving him a hug. And he literally went from crazy man to calm right. person. So I'm walking past this guy in the street and, and he's smoking a cigarette. He looks deranged. I say, good morning, which must be offensive in New York city. And the guy comes out with explicatives screaming at me. <laughs> and then it, so much so he even yelled at the guy behind me, who's even more innocent <laughs> than I was. But the point is it doesn't change my right. behavior and, and it shouldn't change you your behavior unless you want to monetize right, right. this. And if you want to monetize it, if you think it has a likelihood of occurring, spend the money. If you don't, then don't right, waste your time. Right. Yeah. And for those of you, or 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 accept the fact you're not going to get you're not going to get the gold pot at the right. end of the rainbow. Right. And for and for people happening. who are out there who decide they do want to get the Series Seven and stuff, is it like real estate where you can just place your license? You know, people will take your license and on the off chance that you'll get it, or do they have to pay a fee for that? How does that How does that work? They don't have to pay a fee, but that the the brokerage firm who sponsors you to take the test has an obligation to supervise mm. you. So if they think it's a wing and a prayer on average, that's not who they want. They're right. running a business and they don't want the liability. And if they think you're going to be, if your personality doesn't fit the mold, that you're going to be out there and, and going wild, they're the ones yeah. holding um, the bulk of liability. Okay. What are you, like I've heard people describe family offices as kind of the next frontier in, uh, you know, in capital raising and that sort of thing. What's your opinion of, of the family office space now? If I had a project and I was looking for money, is the family office space a good place to go to raise money? It's a, it's a place. It depends on the project. It depends on the family. It depends on the relationship mm. with the family. So I would view the family office as any other sophisticated investor. By the way, if we talk about changing capital raising, I would argue SPACs and the popularity of SPACs has really changed the model, at least temporarily. So explain, all right, so yeah, let's get into that a little bit. Um, I've done I've done some work okay. with a couple of clients in this area. Explain to folks what a SPAC is. So first, SPAC stands for Special Purpose Acquisition Company. So it's a blind pool. They raise money specific to an industry. They're not allowed to identify thus they can't even disclose because they haven't identified who the penultimate portfolio company is that they would want to acquire. So it could be education, technology, gaming, and they raise money in the blind pool from investors. And once they raise it, they have a period of time to invest it. And if they don't invest it by that period of time, they have an obligation to return it. But it's a way of taking a private company public because the SPAC is a public company. So it's the equivalent of a reverse merger. Yeah, that's what I was just going to say. It used to be it used to be considered the reverse merger market, and now it's uh, now SPACs are all the rage. There's a there's a there's a money laundering risk here too. If you got if you've got like somebody on the sanctions list who's looking to invest in the SPAC, right? Talk about how you have to be careful with those. Well, but that's with any that's really with any capital investment. You should run them past an OFAC list, and usually for private funds and for other commingled vehicles. They have a party that scrubs each of the names to make sure they comply with common reporting standards, anti-money laundering, and double-check the OFAC list. Since the Russian invasion of the Ukraine, 
and speaking with some of our clients that are administrators, what they used to do quarterly, they're now doing yeah. monthly to comply with the sanctions. Yeah. You know, we've, we've experienced this with, uh, I, I live in Miami and, uh, I spend about half my time in New York, half my time in Miami and we experience, and we're opening an office. Oh, wonderful. We, we've spent, uh, we, we've seen people over the years, uh, we've seen the real estate market here evolve to where it used to be, Hey, you know, we, we would do a cursory. I don't, I say we like the, the firm that was, uh, that was putting together a real estate deal would do a cursory review of the lawful sourcing of funds to make sure it was, you know, it was legit. Now, some of these deals, they're actually hiring separate law firms and paying them to do, you know, sourcing of the funds, even with real estate deals to make sure it's clean money that's coming in because they don't want the, they don't want the consequences of that. Um, all right. So now we've also had, we've also had clients where after they've taken money from an investor, they, the person's name shows up on the OFAC oof. list and that becomes a bigger morass because it becomes a cost to the business becomes a cost to their vendors. So we've worked with what are called third party administrators in connection with some of their underlying fund clients where somebody came up on OFAC and how to deal with it. And basically the money, my memory has been in those experiences, the money becomes mm. frozen. Like you can't, you, you really should not, you have to, we have to debate or discuss what do you do with investments that the money's already been made into? Yeah, no, that's a that's a situation that you really don't want to find yourself in. All right, Ron, let's take a couple of minutes and talk to the people who are out there now, who are listening, who are who are watching, who are accountants, who are uh, attorneys, who are people who work in the finance world, who could potentially uh, use your services. Who is the ideal person for us to connect you with, or the ideal company, or the ideal, the ideal firm for us to connect you with? Uh, great question. On average, it would be middle market. So we, our firm does mergers and acquisitions. We have a litigation team, regulatory compliance, we do tax, ERISA, just to mention a few. I focus on asset managers who have either launched businesses, wealth management firms that are registered as, a, registered as an investment advisor, or they provide advisory services to funds, either directly or some advisory. But we also represent accounting firms, uh, brokerage firms. We represent over 200 mm. broker dealers. So it's pretty much from my perspective for work I specifically do anything in the financial services industry. So by way of example, we're working with a group in Miami who um, is looking to, uh, um, trying to think, they built Paramount, uh, the block downtown mm -hmm. of Miami, a client by the name of Dan Cozy. So he was, he launched a real estate fund. We worked with him. Um, client, like I said, it's global. So it comes in from Canada, comes in from all over Europe, comes in from Asia. So it's anything in the asset management space, or we also represent investors. And some of those are high net worth persons to family offices and we'll negotiate their deals. So by way of example, right now we're working on a deal, family office in Monaco, putting a significant sum of money, a, a big eight figure number, and helping somebody launch a crypto fund. So we're negotiating the seed terms to restructure the fund, the management entities, everything under the sun. Mm. And we've introduced them to law firms and Cayman and the board of directors. So we'll, we know all the vendors or all the active vendors around the world in this space. So it's not just doing the legal. Launching a business is only part of it. So sit there and just presume you're going to work with this lawyer on the launch and have little to no contact after would be, um, in my mind, a mistake. It's the ongoing representation and not just the legal, but having like practical commercial knowledge is more as valuable as also knowing how to dot the I's and cross the T's. And so a lot of times, I know about complaints you hear from your industry, but complaints I've always heard about lawyers is they don't render an opinion. So a lot of times I'm rendering an opinion to the degree the client wants. And I usually catch it. If I were in your shoes, I would do X, Y, and Z. And I don't get upset if they don't do it. I don't act paternalistic on them. But so our clients can range from, we, we represent very large institutions and we'll also represent people launching products with just a few million dollars in their pocket. So it, it really goes all over the place. But um, I was on the phone with an American living in London yesterday 
She's uh, launching, a, it's a social group in the, in the crypto space. Um, it's called a DAO. So I was looking through her pitch book and it's not even a client at this stage. I just like her demeanor, her appreciation for the give and take of the conversation. And I think she's going to look to raise 2.5 million or something in that range to finance the operating business. So it really takes all forms. And uh, another client who's getting in the oil and gas space, who's building a cracker in trying to build a cracker and raise money in Virginia. So it, it, it is to say it's such a broad constituency of clients wouldn't begin to describe it. And it mm. is accurate. So it's really anybody tied to anything tied to money. And, and there's a lot of times where we help people out. Like I was helping a family out where the father was killed by the KKK. And I became friendly with the family. It was when I was at the SEC and I referred him to Morris Dees from the uh, Alabama Southern Poverty Law Center, I believe is this was 20 years ago. So it's not even things where I get, I monetize a relationship. It's if, if we can help people, we help people. It's not just about the client relationship. And I know that sounds hokey or exaggerated, but it's the truth. Like none, nobody on this call or uh, uh, nobody who's listening to this, none of us want to feel commoditized. Right. And, and so I think it, it's by, it starts by doing the right thing. So I'm more apt to take calls, more apt to be introduced to people and try and help them, even if I don't, I or my firm doesn't benefit. Terrific. I love that. And your philosophy is much the same as mine, that the money always follows the relationship. So you might as well might as well start the relationship first. All right, Ron, I want you to give some thought to this. I want three things that we should take away from our time together. I feel like we really just scratched the surface, but there was so much information. We forced people to drink from the fire hose. So distill it down to three important things that people should take away from our time together. I'm going to give you a minute to think about it while I remind people that we're brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. For over 35 years, Sandrowski has been helping people with all the aspects of sophisticated accounting. That includes forensic accounting, litigation support, family office advisory, tax planning, you name it. When it comes to sophisticated accounting, there's a really good chance Sandrowski does this. I want to mention to you because it's so important that Sandrowski can save you millions of dollars when you go to sell your business. So let's say you're you run a mom and pop print shop, but you're the most popular print shop in Hialeah, Florida. You do all the printing for all the big shots throughout Southern Florida, and you're going to go sell your print shop. Well, if you're structured the appropriate way, you can take advantage of a small business tax exemption. Now, small business is broadly defined. You have to be in a very specific industry. The point is you need to call Sandrowski before you're ready to sell. In fact, you should probably call them before you're even thinking of selling. So if you're listening to my voice, basically, you should call Sandrowski today to look at the structure of your business and share your plans for the future with them. The best time to call them when it comes to reviewing your entity formation and the tax consequences would have been when you set up your entity in the first place. The second best time is today. Why? Because some of these tools, they need at least five years of history to have in place before you're ready to sell. So here's what I want you to do. You got a business. You heard me talk about saving millions of dollars, and that's no exaggeration on taxes. I want you to call Sandrowski and just bounce the idea off of them. If they can't help you, they're not going to take your money. The phone number is 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Remember, the best time to call them to look at your tax exposure would have been when you formed your business. The second best time is right now. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors is a CPA firm with a different perspective. Also, remember, I've got a gift for you. If you haven't already claimed it, I don't know what you're waiting for. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, download your free business development plan. I've used this for 15 years to help my clients grow their business through relationships and thought leadership. No hokey cold calling or billboards or any of that crap. We only focus on relationships and thought leadership. If you want a guide to doing this, go to revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info. It's free. It's my gift to you for watching Ron and I, for listening to us today. We appreciate you being here. So Ron Geffner is my guest. He's an ex-SEC enforcement lawyer. He also is a knowledgeable expert on just about 
every type of investment you can imagine. He's gonna tell you that he's better at some than others, but I'll tell you, he would be my first call based on this conversation. I want you to call 212-573-6660. 212-573-6660. Call Ron, he seems like a fantastic guy. He'll answer your questions. Now, if you don't have two nickels to rub together, don't call Ron because I don't want to hear that he's wasting his time with knuckleheads. I want serious people to call him and I want you to call him before you get in trouble. I want you to call him before you raise money. I want you to call him to set the table to do it right. Okay, Ron, so what are the three things we should take away from our time together? So when you're hiring a professional, not just a lawyer, it's hire somebody you respect, somebody you can relate to, somebody you trust. If you're just hiring on um, reputation, but you get a bad feeling on the per with the person, don't work with them. It's just not ideal. It's going to come through. Two, don't commoditize that relationship. That person should become your consigliere. You know, the, the, the thesis is you find a good accountant, you find a good doctor, and you find a good lawyer. It is a relationship where we get to know one another. We don't always, I don't always dispense exactly the same advice in the same manner to two or three people. It's specific to that person. Some people are better listeners. Some people are better thinkers. Some people you really have to sort of hammer the point home to make sure that it resonates. And then the third thing is um, like listen to their guidance. So I was out with a buddy and I've gone to therapy on my own multiple times and I'm hanging out with a buddy of mine and we're talking about really what could be embarrassing things. He's sharing them with me. But then I find out he, he was joking around. It's like, it's funny as I tell you everything, but I lie to my therapist. <laughs> so <laughs> it makes a question, well, why are you going exactly. to that therapist? It's why even participate. But it's the same yeah. thing is, <laughs> Yeah, so in other words, if you feel judged by somebody or you don't feel appreciated, they shouldn't be like doing you a favor by taking your phone call. We've all worked with people where you're like, um, the, the, the relationship is not balanced and you feel like they're doing you a favor to take your call, to dispense guidance or to meet with you. If that's the case also, also not the right relationship. It's a very intimate, long-term relationship. Even if you don't think it is, it almost always is. Like, uh, I don't do criminal work, but if you were going to a criminal lawyer and he helps you through a jam or she helps you through a jam, or either way, you might have to come back to him for the next 20 years to ask questions about its impact on your yeah. life. So, you, and, then, and you, um, I know you only asked for three, but how you say goodbye is as important as how you say hello. I learned that lesson once at a prior um, job. So don't burn bridges. So as a lawyer, when I have people come to me and you cannot get the documents from the prior lawyer, you think I'm really feeling comfortable with my new client? Yeah. No, because they did something wrong to that prior lawyer. And if they did it to that person, there's a chance they're going to do it to me. Wow, that's that last point is money in the bank right there. I, I'll tell you, I learned that the you know the hard way. You don't want to leave any any opportunity, any job. With, with anybody having a bad taste in their mouth because what, what you said is 100% true, getting information or the world is just a very small place these days. People talk and you don't want to have that reputation. You really don't. Ron, it was such a it was such yeah. a pleasure to have you. You gave us so much great knowledge. I thank you for, for being here and sharing your expertise. Oh, Dave, thank you so much for having me. Incredible show. Great attitude, great interview, so thank you so much. No, it was our pleasure, and that will do it for this episode of the Inside BS Show. We'll be back here again tomorrow with another fantastic interview. Of course, nobody will be as good as Ron was, but we'll give it a try again tomorrow. Ron Geffner, thank you so much for joining us. If you want to reach out to Ron, you can do so by calling 212-573-6660. 212-573-6660. We'll see you tomorrow for another edition of the Inside BS Show. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.